have uh, Preston Ganaway, a local Bay Area photographer, here to speak to us. Um, I've known Preston for a while. Um, she is actually one of my go-to photographers at Mother Jones. And it's good to have somebody, um, and I say she's a go-to in that anytime we have a story in the Bay Area or kind of around Central Valley, you know, basically within a day's drive, she's one of the first person I think of for stories. And that's partially because, um, you know, she does great work and honestly, um, beyond just being able to make good pictures, what makes Preston a great photographer is um, she really, she's easy to work with. Um, she has a good vision. She, she makes really good connections with people. And um, like I said, she's easy to work with, which I can't stress enough how far that goes in getting regular work. Um, you can be a great photographer and be a pain in the ass, um, but that will often mean you are not going to be the first person called. Um, so I, I really um, can't stress enough. And, it, it, and that doesn't mean you have to bend over or, or be easy or not have your voice heard, but um, it, there's just a difference between um, being an obstinate jerk and being a smart photographer. And Preston is a smart photographer, both behind the camera and on a person to person level. And that comes through in the pictures because a lot of the stories that we assign Preston are very sensitive or are complex or, or take a lot of very uh, spending time with somebody one-on-one. -on -one. And so that comes through a lot just in how she's able to talk to people and get them to open up for photos. So um, without further ado, um, here's Preston and um, she's going to um, walk us through some of her work. Um, she has a great book. So we'll talk both about uh, taking work as, a, as an assignment photographer, as a freelance photographer, but also working on a, a long-term project and turning that into a, a finished, finalized book. Um, so Preston, take it away. Oh, thanks, Mark. Yeah, thanks so much for the introduction, too. That's always great to hear, because Mark is definitely one of my absolute favorite editors to work for, um, for a lot of the same reasons. But um, yeah, so I thought what I would do is just talk a little bit about my history and show some sort of general portfolio stuff. Um, and then we can kind of branch off from there and talk about whatever you guys want to talk about. Um, editing or, you know, juggling assignment work with personal projects. Um, I don't do a whole lot of these Zoom talks and I find them sometimes a little strange, like I'm seeing icon, you know, like it's hard. I don't have that face to face as much. Um, so I really love to do just open discussion and Q&A. So I really encourage anybody, um, please don't be shy. Like anything you want me to talk about, I'm happy to kind of go in whatever direction y'all are most interested in. So yeah, as Mark said, I am um, based here in the Bay Area and really split my time between assignment work and long form documentary projects. Um, and, you know, I predominantly do assignment work, editorial assignment work. So newspapers and magazines. I do uh, try to do, you know, trying to branch out a little bit more with commercial stuff, frankly, because uh, it makes it easier to make ends meet. But um, that's been sort of a tough nut to crack for me personally. So um, newspapers and magazines have been my bread and butter and um, really enjoy that work as well. So when I grew up, I was uh, focused on art and painting and drawing, but my professional background is in community photojournalism. So, and that very much informs all of the work that I do now, um, at least my people-centered work. So there's always sort of a back and forth with me with, and my work between journalism and art. So I, um, I grew up, I was raised in Charlotte, uh, North Carolina. You know, it was really as a teenager that I started to migrate from art into photography and transferred to a very small liberal arts school in Virginia to, um, to major in photography. And, you know, I really didn't have much training in journalism. I kind of fell into newspapers, really. Um, and it's, it's funny to say now, but in the early 2000s, uh, journalism was like a pretty good way to make money, make a living. And so I was able to, you know, get a job at a really tiny paper right out of college and, you know, get paid to take pictures, which was, you know, awesome. Um, let me see if I can 
share my screen and I'll flip through a few pictures. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Let's see if this works. Actually, here, let me do it this way. Sorry, guys, I hadn't really done this before, so this will work. Okay, can you all see that okay? Yep, it's perfect. Okay. Um, so this is just, we could talk about some of these pictures individually, but this is just sort of a, um, a you know, 20 images that broadly represents, you know, my work. So, um, yeah, like I said, I just really kind of fell into newspapers. And for me, that was, um, you know, I'm really fortunate to have had that time. I spent about 12 years working for newspapers full time. And, you know, the two things that were really um, super beneficial for me in that way, well, I said there's a number of things, but the, the two of the things that stand out is that, you know, one, I had a paycheck. And so I was pretty much immediately able to be financially independent and save some money. And then two, you know, I photographed every day. And, and that was huge. You know, one of the things that I think is so nice about the position I'm in now is, you know, like Mark had said, because I've spent so much time doing assignment work, like I know how to make pictures, right? It's sort of, you know, second nature to me at this point. So I can spend a lot of my other energy focusing on interpersonal relationships with people, thinking about the story creatively, um, all of the, you know, business stuff of trying to survive as a photographer and as a freelancer. Um, so yeah, so it was really just doing shooting every day that kind of built that foundation for me that enabled me to, um, to focus on other things and, and be able to make pictures a little more easily. Um, you know, and then the other thing that, that I really got from, from my time, uh, working full-time in journalism was learning how to connect with people. Um, I was really... I was really shy growing up and I really struggled to figure out how to talk to strangers, you know, frankly. Um, and, and it was really doing work for newspapers, being on the community, learning how to, you know, build the relationships that lead to intimate, um, you know, opportunities and image making. Um, and I just was able to hone those skills when I was, um, when I was at newspapers. So my first real break was at a small newspaper in New Hampshire called the Concord Monitor. And at the time it was one of the best small, you know, community photojournalism papers for photographers. And these first few pictures I'm showing are from a project that I started there called the Remember Me Project. So I initially spent, I'll go back and show a couple real quick, um, two years following this family as the mother, Carolyn, and she had uh, three kids, EJ in the center is the youngest, and she was fighting terminal cancer. And so we did a story, sort of a feature piece, just on what it was like to, um, you know, for a young family to sort of juggle illness and just trying to raise a family. And, and then after she was gone, uh, struggling with, um, you know, coping with her loss and the grieving process. So this was the piece that actually um, went on to win a Pulitzer for Feature Photography in 2008. Um, but the cool thing about it is that, or one of, you know, one of the things that, the reason why I always show it is because I'm still, I'm still working on this. So the project now is in its 15th year and it focuses on the father and son. This is EJ and his father, Rich. And it explores themes of memory and loss and, and masculinity. So EJ was four when his mother died. And next month, he's going to graduate from virtually graduate from high school. Uh, I actually planned to spend most of this spring in New Hampshire. Um, but, you know, everything, as you all know, has been sort of has, has changed. Can I ask you a question, quick question? Yeah, of course. So when you're working on a large project like this, at what point, I know it's not like a magic turning point, but at what point kind of do you realize this project is about these larger themes 
you know, loss and masculinity and all that versus, you know, working on a story about this woman dying of terminal cancer and how, you know, it, 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 yeah. it kind of evolves, I guess, into something larger. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a good question. I, um, for me, it's really, you know, having a, pro it's been interesting having a project that I've, that's been with me throughout my whole career, basically. And so a lot of it is just how I've changed as an artist. Whereas when I was a photographer at working for a newspaper, I was, you know, there to tell a story and very much like, you know, this is, you know, this is what this family's going through. You know, it's very moment driven. Um, you know, you can look at the pictures and, you know, see A plus B equals C, you know, it, it has a very linear quality to it. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and now I'm, you know, 3000 miles away from the family and I'm only able to go a couple of times a year. And so I, I have sort of, I have a stepped back view of it. And also just generally, I think I look, you know, I'm just more interested in making pictures that are a little bit more open-ended um, and, you know, open to interpretation. Like I, you know, I can't, you know, I can't really say like the project that I have now is like about EJ and his father and what it's been like for him to lose his mother and grow up without her. It's, um, it's much looser than that, right? A little bit more conceptual, but still grounded in that documentary tradition. Mm -hmm. Makes um, sense. And, you know, I'm doing a lot of landscape work now with it too, which has been cool. Um, you know, trying to make images that evoke feelings, you know, and a lot of it, frankly, is my personal feelings with the project and the family, you know, so... So I think for for this project, I would say, yeah, it's just been sort of the, the natural progression of of me continuing to make this project and have it change alongside me. So I have a, kind of a follow up question. When you since you're only able to go shoot a couple times a year, when you go back, are you looking for specific images or do you just kind of let things unfold as they unfold or is it kind of a mix? Yeah, I'd say it's a mix. I mean, I, I like to have a shot list, you know? Um, so I definitely have a list of things that I'm looking for. Um, and, you know, I try to, there's usually some reason why I'm going back, you know, like something is happening. Uh, but actually sometimes it's like, well, I'm just, I'm going to, I've got to be in New York and I've got a few extra days. And so it's just going to be easier to get over there. But I think most of the time, you know, I try to time it to, you know, EJ's play or, um, you know, Mother's Day, I've gone, you know, during that. So, uh, yeah, but, but then I really am at the mercy of like whatever happens to be happening when I'm there. And so I do spend a lot of time, you know, letting go and, and just seeing, you know, what, what I see while I'm there. So it's very, it's very open-ended and, and actually it's really fun. I, I mean, I prefer working that way now where, you know, I'm less in control, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it, it enables me to slow down more and I think be more present, which is nice too. Yeah. So, you know, just looking at, looking at details, this is the, Rich's car. He was the father. It was commuting a lot. He was working in Maine and living in New Hampshire. And, you know, it's just, it's funny. I remember when he bought this car new and now EJ has this car. This was EJ's first car. So just looking at little markers and, and how they can tell a larger story and also convey themes of, you know, what this family's going through. And, and then, you know, hopefully one themes that other people can relate to that are more universal. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so this is EJ and his um, stepmother. Uh, he was feeling sick and she was feeling his face to see if he had a fever. I think this is probably the last one I have here in that section. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so let's see. So this is actually from, I think, a couple so of pictures. I'm sorry, does somebody have a question? No, okay. Um, this is from 
uh, a little series I pitched to the Atlantic on urban farms in West Oakland, where I lived for a long, when I first moved to the Bay Area, I lived, lived in West Oakland for seven years, just moved from there actually. Uh, so looking at, you know, oh, I guess it's just the one, sorry. <laughs> I don't know exactly what's in this folder. Um, but yeah, this is, uh, this image is from that. So I do a lot of work, um, both personally and on commission that uh, has to do with the LGBTQ um, community. So I grew up queer in the South and that was very much a, you know, pretty formative part of my identity. And so it's something that I've always been interested in shooting wise. And then this is um, another picture from another long-term project, not as long, but about five years I spent documenting, documenting a neighborhood that I lived in in Virginia. Uh, and this is the Between the Devil and the Deep Blue Sea project. Where in Virginia? Uh, Norfolk. Oh, okay, nice. Yeah. I'm originally from Martinsville, Henry County, south of Roanoke. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a beautiful area too. Yeah, I actually lived in Virginia twice. I went to school in Southwest Virginia and then lived in Norfolk for five years in Southeast Virginia. Mm. So this was where I lived. This was my last uh, full-time newspaper job actually, it was at um, a paper called the Virginia Pilot. And mm -hmm. so one of the things that's kind of cool about this project, it was sort of a bridge for me back into you know, the fine art world and working in a way that I do now versus, you know, just uh, assignment work for a client. So when I was living in Norfolk, I was able to, I, I pretty quickly started this project. Um, this was the neighborhood I was living in and this was really my favorite part about being in the area. Before I moved to Norfolk, I had lived, you know, in New Hampshire and kind of bounced around a lot. And so this was my first time being back in the South and uh, was really just drawn to this community. You know, it was just, you know, quirky and, but diverse and like really, um, I don't know, I just really, there was a lot of things about it that I really loved and I was really drawn to. And so I spent a lot of time wrapping in my assignment work for the newspaper into this personal project. So the when you look at the book now i think and i think we might look at the pdf later in terms of editing but i, th I went through and counted i think something like a third of the work i made on my own at the very end but two thirds of it you know i made while i was at the newspaper and maybe a third of that i made like for the newspaper so it was very much like this sort of um back and forth between me working um, using my day job to make the work that I wanted to make, if that makes sense. So I have a question. Uh, yeah, great. Uh, it, you mentioned earlier that you know, when you're working for the newspaper that you were there, tell a story, that idea of I'm there to do this thing, right? It's almost like an agenda, whether it's your own personal agenda or it's the newspaper or your boss or whatever. And it could be like totally positive ones, but, uh, and then you, you know, because it was around, um, I forget his name, but uh, the mother who was sick, right? Mm -hmm. And it seemed like opportunistic, if you will, to show up on Mother's Day because there would be like kind of a built-in emotional response. Where is it, uh, I guess my question is, is like, you can do personal work and tie it into other person person's agenda is or does that get foggy or how do you how do you navigate that kind of uh, thing like uh, are you are, do you answer to like other people's like I want to I, I want you to get this story here's your here's your shot list and this is what we want and you can't come back with something slightly different where does that become problematic or how do you how do you go about that so yeah I think I, I think I understand your question um, well, yeah, I mean, two points right off the bat, I guess I should just clarify is that I, you know, I still work, you know, like my approach is, is like a 
photojournalist and if I'm shooting photojournalism, it, it definitely is where, you know, I don't set things up. I don't stage things. I don't tell people where to go. Um, there are a lot of documentary photographers who, um, you know, work a little differently and a little looser and, you know, that's fine too. But, you know, that's just not the way I've, I've done my work. Right. So, you know, any, I mean, you guys know what that means, right? I'm just not directing people. So unless it's a portrait situation, but um, so, you know, just want to make sure I, you know, get that across. And then, you know, the other thing is, you know, I mean, everything is from my perspective and, you know, my view. So, you know, I think that, you know, this idea of being impartial, um, is not something that I concern myself with as much anymore as I did, you know, 10 years ago working at a newspaper, right? Because it's just, you know, we are all coming from our own perspectives and, you know, the work that I do now is much more open and interpretive and it, you know, it's, it's hard to explain, but I think it's, you know, I mean, it's just, it's my view. Of, it's my telling a story, right? That, the dubs to me it's about this community right or it's about this family but it's still like you know my very much my version of it right i mean they would tell their own story a little differently everybody in this community would tell their story differently um but you know i also take my relationships with um, the people i photograph like very seriously and you know it's very much a collaboration i think for me um you know, again, it sort of depends on which project we're talking about, but I, you know, if I'm doing a story with an individual or about an individual, I want the communication to constantly be open, right? And, and them to help, you know, I can't photograph parts of people's lives unless I know about them and they invite me to be there, right? So it's, um, to me, it's a partnership in a lot of ways. And, and if this project is, I mean, I, I'm not sure if this was one of the things you were interested in, but you know, if a, if a story is also extremely personal, like the remember me project, um, I have a very different way of working with people and that they, you know, they, they do have some veto power, right. When it comes to images and of course situations, right. Cause they either allow me to be there or not. Um, but I, you know, there, there are photographs that I've asked them, you know, if, if they feel comfortable before I put it out there. Thanks. Yeah. It was kind of a, I was still trying to figure out what I was asking, <laughs> but, uh, I guess, uh, I mean, I, I came up with this idea in regards to COVID, right. Mm -hmm. I pitched it to somebody and they said, yeah, that's a good idea. Now I want you to go and get this type of shot and that type of shot and have this. And there's like some staging involved. Mm -hmm. that, that's not what I want to do. <laughs> and I don't feel like in order to get the story seen that I need, if I, I need to do those things in order to get the story seen, it's not going to be what I came up with in the first place. And, yeah. so, um, and I know we all have to like pay the rent, but uh, at the same time, how does, I guess it was my question is how does one navigate personal integrity and okay. marry that with like uh, your boss's agenda, if you will. Right, right. Okay, I see. So the, yeah, so that's a little different. Um, you know, the work I do for clients, you know, what is my assignment work now? I mean, you know, I, I mean, I wouldn't, you know, do anything that I felt unethical or like really that I felt was not a fair representation of somebody but but otherwise like I want to make the clients happy like that is my goal because I want to get hired again and you know I'm going to be able to pay my bills so the personal projects you know are, are different and I'm much more protective of those and you know I call the shots but if someone hires me to go do something like I want to know what they want and I want to make them happy I, mean, I just do so yeah so it is very different and then you know with the staging and setting up stuff um you know a lot of magazines are different than newspapers um i'm trying to think if i've had you know I, again I, I feel like you have to kind of 
or what I've done is mold myself. You know, you have to be sort of flexible and depending on who you're working for and what they need. Um, you know, I, I, I have different ways of working. Right. Um, and I think there's an important point there where, um, you definitely want to deliver what the client wants, like Preston said, but I think there's often room on shoots, especially if it's an assignment that means something to you to make your own pictures alongside of those, get what the client needs, but then also make pictures that you're seeing that and that you want to make. And sometimes you can include those in the edit. You know, it might be something that the editor wasn't looking for, but sparks something good and you might even be able to get those in the in the in print yeah yeah no definitely that's a great point um and i think most of the time the images that i make on assignment that i like that i want to show you know in my portfolio or my book or whatever like are not necessarily the ones that best serve the publication mm -hmm. so, and i think mark and mother jones might be one of the exceptions where i think i think i've got a couple pictures in here um that are the same frame or very close to a frame, you know, that, that you guys ended up running. But yeah, I mean, I, I do think that there's both of those goals. Like I want to make the client happy and then, yeah, I want to make a picture that I'm proud of in whatever way, um, whether it fits into a larger project or if it's just one that I, you know, that I, that I want to show other people. Yeah. Those, those two goals are running at the same time. I mean, like, like I told, like I always tell you guys, um, you know, it's important to include images in an edit that you really feel strongly about, but also try not to include anything that you do not ever want to see in print because invariably those are the ones that will get picked. So be very <laughs> careful of what you submit. Right. And that's hard too. I, yeah, that can be tougher, I think, um, when you really want to make a client happy and you don't know what they want, right? And I, I sort of cast a wide net when I send a low res edit. And yes, it definitely happens pretty frequently that, you know, the cringiest frame is the one that they ended up running. Yep. Good question, Pete. Yeah. So let's see, this is another um, couple pictures from that project. And so how did this project start? You, you mentioned that it you shot it for about five years, but kind mm -hmm. of um, how did it start and how did you decide that it could and should be a book? Yeah, well, it started just because I was drawn to photograph there. Um, and, and then, you know, actually one of my coworkers at the paper, Bill Tiernan, mentioned at some point, like, oh, you should do a book, just sort of in passing. And it did seem like, oh, okay, well, that's a good thing to sort of have in my head, uh, an idea to work toward you know, building a larger body of work. I, you know, I hadn't, it, this is the, the only book that I've hundred percent finished. So yeah, I mean, the other thing with this project, um, so it's got these geographic limits and, you know, time limits because I was there for five years shooting. Um, but other than those two things, it has a pretty broad, you know, it's about a lot of different things, right? Um, a lot of different themes kind of go in and out of it. And so the book form was really, it, it's the one I feel the best about the body of work in book form versus, you know, on the wall or, you know, in a small edit. Um, I think sometimes it's just hard to translate, you know, a body of work or a project in, you know, 10 pictures or 12 pictures or, you know, we're constantly like editing for grants and publications or whatever. And it's, you know, a lot of times I'm like, well, this, you just don't get the sense of what the story is in this number. So in the book form, when I can have, you know, a lot more images, I think there's 68 in the, in the final book. So I can have that many pictures and I can really think about the sequencing and I can pair it with text. I think, there's lots of different ways you can weave a narrative together. And I just think the, the work feels more complete in that way. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, another thing talking about the book. Um, so when I, so I put it together and basically I, I left Norfolk, moved to California. My partner got a job out here. And so that's why we moved here. 
and I spent the first year like starting to freelance slowly, but also working on this project. And that was partly so I didn't have to sit around waiting for the phone to ring. Um, because that's never fun to do. So I, you know, it's another nice thing about personal projects is it gives you something else to work on. Um, so you're not just waiting around, but, uh, so I spent a year, you know, editing and sequencing and figuring out like physically how we were going to produce this book. I did crowdfunded it. So, you know, that was all like, you know, crowdfunding campaign on Kickstarter and there's a lot of different parts of it, but I think that I had estimated at one point that about 10% of that bookmaking process was creative and 10% might even be a little high. And I think that that is a pretty good translation of like just generally my work, right? Would be maybe 10% is creative and then 90% is just other crap, right? That you have to do. Yes. Hustling. So much of it is hustling. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, this is another, uh, this is one image from a project. Uh, so I did a little series on queer youth and um, this woman, uh, Callie Young Woman, was 19 at the time when she was at the Pulse nightclub in Orlando during that shooting. And her cousin was dancing with her. She went with her cousin and he was killed. So I spent a few I did a few trips and you know spent some time documenting her life in the first year after the pulse shoot. Well actually yeah yeah the first year after the pulse shooting. This body of works really good. Mm, thank you. This is one for Mark. This was um, a piece for Mother Jones on the cost of gun violence. So this is a young man named Kamari who lives in Sacramento and was in a uh, drive-by shooting and had multiple gunshots. And so they did a breakdown of like hospital costs, right? And just like literally what the financial cost is for, you know, gun violence. Could you talk a little bit about this? Like um, just kind of, I guess, walk us through like this assignment. So I call you and you get in touch with Kamari and kind of how do you, broker that get to the point where you're photographing this total stranger in such a vulnerable beautiful kind of photograph yeah let's see i guess it's sort of i don't know i i guess every case is different it is because you know you mentioned that um you know growing up you were very shy mm -hmm. and i will say without a doubt in every single class i've taught the number one hurdle is people being shy and not wanting to talk to strangers. And so okay. kind of figuring a way to break that has always been my biggest nut to crack. Yeah, I, it's, it's definitely hard. And, you know, I like to always make a point to say that um, because I think that, you know, it's, it's a very common thing that we struggle with. And I personally... I mean, the artists who I'm the most drawn to are also shy people, right? And then it's, and it is a process just trying to learn how to get over that. But I think that some, that a lot of times the best work comes out of that struggle in that process. So, you know, another thing that I think is really important is to try to use, you know, your, to be genuine, but use your personality traits or, you know, physical traits to your advantage. So, you know, as a woman, I am less intimidating. And, um, you know, I often like looked younger than I was. Uh, I don't know if that's the case anymore. But, um, you know, I was able to because people didn't, a lot of times they didn't take me seriously. And that could be, um, that could be really advantageous, right? So I could sort of slide like slip under the radar in certain situations. Um, and then, you know, I think also being, being shy, you know, other people, you know, other introverts can connect with you more easily, right? Um, so, yeah, Kamari was gay, too, which was really cool. Um, so that helped, right? Um, you know, I think, I, I don't really know how to, let's see, I'm trying to remember, like, with this particular situation. I mean, I remember I called him up and 
just made a plan to go over there and I don't know, just spend some time talking to him. You know, I think that's another thing that was really hard for me and was a process just learning that I had to open up to other people in order to expect them to open up to me. And that there's a lot of time where you just have to talk in order to build that relationship, which is like so obvious, I guess now, but at the time I was really drawn to photography because I, um, because I wanted to not interact. I just wanted to be the fly on the wall. And, and it was learning that that wasn't helping that, that, you know, that that's not how you do it, or at least not, not how you do what I wanted to do. Um, yeah, I don't remember exactly how we, but this was in his apartment, um, you know, natural light. Uh, he had a blank wall. So I often am shooting portraits kind of on the fly, environmental situations and, you know, looking for nice natural light and clean backgrounds. And um, he's in a wheelchair. I remember, so he was, you know, just sitting. I mean, we were, that obviously kind of, you know, limited so much or just, you know, guided what we did like shooting wise. And we did a few different locations, but yeah, this was just in his apartment. And I can't remember the discussion of taking a shirt off, but you know, at some point you're just like, Hey, you know, do you have a scar? You know, do you feel comfortable? Is this something that, you know, do you feel comfortable showing, you know, having some pictures where you can see these scars? Cause it's, I mean, that's what it's about. Right. Um, so yeah, and then I think there's also, you know, shooting a lot and getting just these side moments where he was stretching and closed his eyes. Um, you know, I think a, there's a lot of luck involved too, right? Where I didn't tell him to lean back and close his eyes. It just, as we were shooting, um, this was a fleeting moment that I think ended up just working really well. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, thanks. Question. Yeah. So when you're doing a project like this, do you typically just set up a, uh, a tripod and just kind of like shoot remotely as you're talking or are you walking around the subject while you're having this conversation? Like what's your approach for mm -hmm. taking the photo? Yeah, so I don't shoot with a tripod, uh, which I sometimes, sh I think I should, but no, I always handhold um, and I do, it varies, but I, I do like to talk to people um, when we're working. And, you know, it's tough because some people talk a lot and then, and then it's hard to get moments where they're not like, you know, where it's obvious that they're talking. Uh, but yes, I definitely do. I, you know, I like people to move around some and I like to talk to people while we're shooting. Yeah. To keep it, you know, I also try to keep things feeling pretty casual. I think, you know, a lot of people, I'd say most people are uncomfortable having their picture taken. And so I keeping it casual. And again, I think this is something that sort of works to my advantage in the way that I work and just, you know, who I am is I just, you know, kind of keep things chill and flexible as much as possible and you know try to really make people at ease because if people aren't at ease I, I, you know, I can't really it's hard for me to make a good picture yeah and then you know we'll just spend some time you know it, it depends but you know it's usually as much time as I can get and go into different in a portrait situation you know doing a few different uh setups as they say although I don't really set up that much but yeah finding a good spot and putting a person in that place and you know trying different things different lighting um you know modifying but as i said i work with you know mostly available light yeah yeah i have a question too about that i appreciate what you said you know it i find that as soon as i as soon as i raise the lens the the, the expression changes you know what i mean and that's the most challenging part for me is to keep the normal, normalcy going and then be able to get the thing up in the air at the same time, you know what I mean? Without their face changing or anything. And even the click of the shutter can like snap them out of it and make them, oh, I'm getting photographed now, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I just wonder what your 
tricks or I guess it's, there is no trick. It's just being as casual as possible. I don't really know. What do you, how do you go about that? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I, I generally photograph a lot. And so, you know, the shutter is going off pretty frequently. So they, you know, they have to kind of block that out, I think. Um, you know, a lot of times, not a lot of times, but sometimes I'll work with assistants and I think that helps too. Then there's another person there who they can interact with. Um, you know, I think, I mean, really talking to them, I guess, is the biggest thing. And spending time, you know, the, the worst thing for me is when I take a few pictures and then someone's like, okay, are you done yet? You know, you have what you need. Because then it makes me sort of nervous and, you know, and it's just too rushed. You know, I mean, I like to spend, I mean, at least a half an hour, but I try to budget, you know, a good hour. So I want people to know that they've got to like settle in. Because I think that's just a misconception too, that people think, and I mean, some photographers work this way, but they think, okay, you sit down and you smile and then you're done, right? And so in the work that I do, you know, I just, I need to spend time. And there are many moments within, you know, a photo shoot like this. So, yeah, I think setting up expectations is important. And, and so a time frame is part of that, for sure. It's to just to, you know, when you're setting something up with someone, say, you know, I need, you know, 45 minutes to an hour or something like that. Um, so then they know, like, okay, you know, they can't just rush out the door, right? And, you know, I also think there's a lot of interpersonal stuff where, if people feel comfortable and they feel like it's a good experience, then not only do I make a better picture, but then they like the picture better too. Um, I just think there's a lot of, you know, it's gotta be, you know, it's gotta be a good experience in some ways. Yeah, I, I think it, part of it is, you know, if you think, you know, the only experience people have ever had with having their picture made in the setting, is in school where it is that kind of you know smile bam you're out and so that's what they're expecting and so like Preston said it's reconfiguring their expectations of what having your portrait made is yeah yeah exactly and I I don't know what other people remember of that but I just remember that was so uncomfortable right because you had to like arch your back and move your chin and tilt your head and I mean you just feel like you're contorted yeah, and I don't want to do that. I mean, I do have to direct people a fair amount sometimes, a lot of the times. Um, but, you know, I don't want people to be, you know, to feel like that physically. I, a lot of times I just tell people, like, you know, what feels the most comfortable to you? Like, you want to cross, I need them to do something different with their arms. You want to cross your arm and lean against something. And then you can sort of tell if they're like, oh, that feels weird. And, and I tell them, well, if it feels weird to you, it's going to look weird in the picture. So I want people to engage as much in their own body language. So it's trying just to figure out how to do that as well. How much information do you add outside of the frame to create the narrative? Meaning uh, you, uh, you told me that you told us that he was sitting in a wheelchair. That totally changed the, the story for me. I didn't realize he was even sitting in a wheelchair. <laughs> Is it necessary to do a lot of uh, extra info outside of the frame? Or? Um, well, it just depends on what the story you're trying to say, you're trying to tell. And you know, the reason why I threw that out there is I was just replaying, you know, the situation in my head. And I didn't know, I think I didn't know he was in a wheelchair until I showed up. Um, but, and I think, you know, we shot some, and Mark may even remember more than me. I think we shot, you know, I think I, we moved, I moved some frames where you could see it, but yeah, I don't know if it matters really. Yeah, there were definitely some images um, where you could see the wheelchair, but I think in the end, it, it didn't matter as much that he was in a wheelchair and it was kind of the scar, like Preston said, was kind of really it. And more than anything, his expression, you know, it, it almost looks like this exhalation sort of, you know, it's, it's so expressive. Yeah. Actually, so I figured out how to know the picture that's coming up after the one I'm showing you, and and ironically, it's another um, person in a wheelchair. But we can talk about this as sort of a different, um, 
you know, contrasting situations. So this is a project that I shot for ESPN on a JV football coach down in the South Bay named Rob Mendez. And Rob was born without arms or legs. And so this was a feature story on just what it's like for this guy, you know, to coach football. Uh, and I spent a number of months documenting him. And I don't think we did any portraits. Like, I don't, yeah, it was all documentary. I mean, what I would consider documentary, right? So Candace stuff, and this is just on the sidelines, obviously, like in the middle of him coaching a game, or maybe right before. I think he's talking with the referees before the game, but he might have been arguing with them about a call. I don't remember exactly. Uh, but so, you know, obviously, with so story, right? The reason why we're doing this story is because, you know, he is so different physically um, than you know, than most people. And so, you know, that had to constantly be reinforced in the pictures, right? But yeah, um, I think it just depends. And, you know, I mean, this is, you know, I guess I would sort of consider this a portrait, but it's, but it's definitely more of a moment. And like I said, it's a, it's a natural, um, just kind of a natural moment that happened during the course of, of, shooting um this was a really fun story i love shooting teenagers and high school kids are so much fun and so i really the thing that i love the most about this project was just hanging out with this football team these kids were so great so i just loved watching their faces and you know just getting to just hang out and watch them was just endlessly fascinating to me so this was just during a huddle like the layering of the different faces my question, oh yeah, go ahead. My question about this in particular is like, what kind of channels do you go through to actually do photography like this, where you are taking photos of minors? Like, do you get permission from the parents, or because me personally, I do not like taking photos of kids because I don't want to go through that hassle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I can understand that too. Well, the nice thing about editorial work is you know, you really just need a verbal consent, right? So unless it's, you know, a commercial thing, I don't need a model release, right? I don't need a signed document. So, you know, schools are always tricky. <laughs> well, they can be tricky or they cannot be tricky. It just depends on how they handle it. But it's really kind of under the school's jurisdiction at this point. So I don't know exact i mean they must send home media releases that's a common thing that schools do is they can send a media release home at the beginning of the year you know the best thing is to do it passively where you just say if you do not want your kid photographed by the media for whatever situation let us know otherwise you've given permission right so then it's it's up to the school so this school they were just they were great and i checked with the principal and he was like yep everybody's fine so i'm like yeah, yeah, I think mostly when you're shooting in schools, um, exactly like Preston said, we do that a lot. Um, it's, it's basically up to the school and they, they send releases. Most schools send releases out at the beginning of the year, just like Preston said. And then so you're working with the teachers and the principal to help figure out who you can and can't photograph. And so, which is different than like going to a playground or whatever, but like in a school setting, um, you're general, it's generally on the school to, to cover that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, I mean, I think that's a, you know, there's definitely a difference with being a woman versus being a man photographing children. I mean, it's easier for me than it would be for a lot of other, you know, guys. Uh, and so it's just knowing, you know, there's a lot of things that are much harder for me than, than for men, but that's one where I, you know, I mean, I've certainly run into situations where people get upset, but people, you know, it's just, I don't seem as threatening, right? But so like in public, what I would do is if it's a young kid, I definitely try to find the parent, right? And ask permission. But if it's a teenager or something like that, I mean, these, these kids that, you know, they know if their parents are concerned about that stuff or not, right? And so a lot of times if the parents aren't around, I would just say, hey, do you think your parents would mind? And if they say, you know, usually they say, no, my parents wouldn't care. And then I was like, okay, cool. And then I'll give them a business card and say, here's my information, you know, 
uh, have them contact me or whatever if there are any questions. So that that's one way I would handle it if if I had taken this picture, you know, not at a school, but in like a more public setting. All right, let's see. There's, I think, two other frames here. Um, this is just another picture, it's sort of a, a random image that I made uh, working for uh, the Virginian pilot. Again, I did this in Virginia, a story that I did on uh, judgment houses, which was this evangelical um, thing uh, that this church was doing to it's like a play that they put on. I don't know if you guys are familiar with these things, it's like a hell house where they put on this play to, you know, to convert people to Christianity, kind of scare them. Um, this was between, um, just a kind of a between moment while these, you know, actors basically are rehearsing. And then this is another one for Mark. This is actually my closing in this selection. Um, and actually these, I didn't even put this together for this particular purpose. So, but that's how much I, um, I like the, the work that I get to do with Mark. Um, so this is for a piece on the census. And I went out to the Central Valley and photographing, um, you know, a lot of the communities where they, they were, they were worried that, um, that the census would um, not be able to fairly represent um, certain, you know, Latin communities um, and immigrant communities. So this was during, uh, it was it was really, it was funny. This was like a very kind of boring um, slide, you know, PowerPoint presentation that someone was giving, but I thought this woman, you know, and her baby were just like so beautiful in the light. And, um, you know, it's, again, it's like, it feels sort of like a portrait, but it's very much just a found moment. And a big thing, you know, with Mother Jones, we run into it a lot, and Preston's really good at this, is figuring a way to make a portrait of somebody that shows who they are without being able to identify them. Because um, that's a big concern, you know, with um, some of the migrant communities, or, you know, we do stories on uh, survivors of rape who may not want their identity, or um, particularly young women who've had abortions in communities where that's not okay. Um, so we do a lot of or former prisoners or whatever. Um, so we do a lot of stories like that in Preston. This is a good example kind of of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that tends to come up with a lot of assignments more and more, uh, especially like in the Me Too era. Um, yeah, a lot of different, you know, subjects and situations that come up where, yeah, you don't want people to be identifiable. And then also going back to the school thing, you know, this is the worst case scenario, but sometimes I'll be sent uh, to make pictures in school where you can't show people's faces. Um, and so you got to have a few tricks up your sleeve in order to deal with that. Anybody have any questions for Preston while we're here? We're coming up on an hour. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, and actually I'll, I'll stop screen sharing and we can uh let's see if i can forget how to do that i can kick you out there yeah um so there's a question in the chat here that says um it asks um do you typically edit and sequence your own work or do you have a friend who you who um you call on to help you with that yeah well actually my partner is an editor so i live with an editor which is very nice yeah. um and oh. Preston's partner is the director of photography at the Chronicle. So powerhouse, great editor. <laughs> yeah. 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 So that's, and actually this morning I was helping her edit, which is fun. So it goes both ways. She actually um, appreciates my opinion too, even though she's the professional editor. Um, yeah. So it depends. I mean, I, I try not to like, bore her with like everything I shoot. You know, I do a fair amount of like business portraits and stuff like that. And she's not as much of a portrait person, right? Because she's in, you know, working for the newspaper and they're very, you know, very much in the storytelling and moments and, um, but yeah, with my own personal stuff, I definitely weigh on her a lot. And, um, and then sometimes just to get her opinion, you know, again, trying to make the client happy, 
you know, I'll definitely show her a situation if I'm like, Ooh, I don't know how they're going to feel about this. Or like, would you be happy if you've got this? So it's really helpful to have that perspective. Um, but then, yeah, usually, you know, I still do most of my own editing and sequencing, but, but get other opinions. Yeah. In regards to your, first of all, your photos actually look really good. I mean, the quality of the photo itself, they're really pretty. <laughs> and, uh, so how much of that is in your mind as well? I mean, I think that's, it heightens the story when you, when we see, when I see really good looking photos that have really strong narratives, it's like, wow, that's the best photo, you know? Okay. So do you spend a lot of time in that post process or are you just that good? Yeah. Uh, well, thanks um, for saying that. I, yeah, I don't do a lot of post process, um, do kind of minimal, uh, you know, darkroom stuff that, you know, in, Photoshop, uh, just basic color correction, dodging and burning. Um, but yeah, but generally I, yeah, I, I like to make pictures and I like to look at pictures that are aesthetically pleasing, kind of no matter what the situation is. So that, that is for me kind of a fundamental thing that I, I don't really, you know, I can't really get past. Like I want, I want something to be visually compelling. So, and you know, it's, it's interesting. A lot of photographers don't necessarily work that way. And there's, you know, very good, you know, intellectually arguments for that, but I, you know, it's just not, not my thing. Right. So, yeah. So I really want to make pictures that are pretty, <laughs> <You know? laughs> even of like situations that, that aren't pretty. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, light is really important. That was one of the first things um, that really made sense to me, like as a photography student was light. And composition, again, you know, I was afraid to talk to people. And so, um, you know, my background as a traditional artist, I think also kind of set me up for, you know, a little bit. The visual stuff was what kind of came the most natural to me. Well, so Adrian here has a question for both of us, Preston. I'll let you take it first. Um, what do you think of the term lyrical documentary? Oh, yeah, I think it's nice. Um, <laughs> I hadn't really heard it, I don't think, as as like a, a genre, sort of. Is yeah, it's, that... it's, um, yeah we, we, we kind of talk about it a lot in class, but yeah, so let, let me know what you, th you think about it. Yeah, I mean, I really like the word lyrical to describe work, um, work that I, you know, am drawn to and hopefully work that I'm making. So yeah, I think that is, yeah, I like it. Yeah, I, I think personally, you know, we, we talk about it a lot, particularly more in kind of more contemporary documentary photography mm -hmm. that, you know, kind of like you were talking about um, is less um, blow by blow and kind of draws on emotion a bit more, I think, and kind of is open to a little bit more interpretation. Mm -hmm. um, which I think is important just as like a way for documentary photography to evolve. Like, you know, you can't just make the country doctor photo essay over and over and over again because it gets boring. And everybody is much more visually literate these days. And I think that's a big part of it too, is the visual literacy is, is way higher now than it was even 20 years ago. And so you need to challenge people a little bit. And I think they're already bringing something to the project and to the images. And so allowing them to interpret it a bit. Yeah, definitely. I totally agree. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions for Preston? We're coming up on an hour. Um, anything else? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty, you know, flexible. So if, the, if there's anything, any other project or commission work or anything that people you know, want to look at a little bit more in depth or talk about a little bit more specifically. Happy to do that. Um, let's talk just really briefly since today's class is about editing, just kind of how long did it take you to put together your book? Mm. And, and specifically kind of um, from the point when you were like, okay, I think I'm finished shooting it. Mm. Uh, and then, you know, kind of how many images when you're at that point, kind of how many images 
were you wading through to getting down to those 68? Well, there were a lot of images um, because, you know, because I've been working on it for so many years. It's like the Remember Me project is super daunting to edit. Um, and that's why I haven't done a book of that work yet because it's just <laughs> a little overwhelming. Uh, but yeah, I, you know, it, it's sort of a weird process with the Between the Devil because I had been, you know, I had gone through, and although it's similar with Remember Me, you know, I've done edits, but then after a number of years, you kind of want to go revisit older stuff and see. I interrupt you really quick. Um, while you're talking, I'm going to um, share my screen and, and page through the PDF. Of okay, great. Yeah. So there's, there's always situations where it's like, oh, you know, I want to go look at that older work again and see if something resonates now that didn't at the time or just in a frame I missed. Uh, so, you know, I don't know how many pictures, I mean, I made a bunch of work prints, just like laser prints or like CVS prints or something. I had all kinds of stuff and, you know, it was probably 300 ish, I'm guessing proofs that we had. And so for this book, I worked with my partner, Nicole, and then also another editor who, who helped with the design to Elisa Koppelman. So she does like editing, design, photo researching. She's based in Austin and uh, does some work for Oxford American and Harper's. So she and, uh, so it was really the three of us who did this. You know, but that said, like there'd been, because I've been working on it for a number of years, like a lot of people had weighed in it, weighed in on it at different times. Um, but for the book, it was really the three of us who, spent a number of weeks and months putting it together and you know we taped it up taped a sequence up um on the wall and that was really helpful and yeah i mean i think a lot of times at least for this project i was pretty democratic about it and if if enough people liked an image then it, it would generally stay in the mix and if I was the only one who liked it, unless I like felt super strong about it, I was willing to let it go. And I think it's really nice when you can trust people like that. And, you know, when I was in Norfolk, there were a lot of other farmers. Um, my stepbrother, actually, Ross Taylor, uh, helped with this a lot. Uh, Matt Eich, you guys are probably familiar with his work. He was around at the time. Um, so there were, you know, we had a really good photo community and I had a lot of really good uh, input over the course of working on this project. Yeah, was there another part of the question, Mark, that I missed? Uh, I don't think so. Um, not necessarily, you know, it's, it's kind of, I, we don't really need the nitty gritty, like how many prep passes it took or whatever, but, um, and then kind of when you had the edit down, I guess, like, okay, this, these are the images I'm gonna use. Um, <clears throat> how did the design of the book, when you started designing it, how did that influence the sequence and did that impact the edit that you came up with at all? Yeah. Um, well, one thing I should say, too, about this project is because I had been working at newspapers for so long, and I had been working for a newspaper when I did a lot of this work, I really wanted total creative control. <clears throat> and so I, I really drove the train, and Elisa was very patient. <laughs> but I made a lot of the, you know, design decisions, and, um, you know, they, they would definitely weigh in and help me execute but um but yeah i was um i was the one making most of those decisions partly because i had been so frustrated you know working in newsrooms for so long um that i really kind of had a vision for how i wanted it to be um but yeah in terms of I mean, it was a lot of back and forth you know she's so been a number of years now but i mean she was constantly sending me pdfs uh, you know, there's so many decisions that go into making a book. You know, I remember, you know, just spending weeks pouring over fonts to figure out which, you know, typefaces we wanted and then what size they were going to be. We did a ton of covers. Um, and that stuff was a little bit tougher because even though, you know, I had opinions and my tastes, like I didn't, I don't know as much about that stuff, right? Whereas with, you know, I know what a good photograph is or to me and I, you know, I had 
stronger opinions about that stuff. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a long process. I, so Elisa was in Austin at the time and I remember we, I got her to come out and she stayed with us and we had planned on doing, you know, most of this in like two or three days. And that was originally part of her negotiation. It was like, I'll play, pay you this flat fee, come stay with us, you know, we'll buy meals, you know, we'll do this in a couple, three days. Right. And, uh, yeah, that was very naive. Uh, cause it was months, you know, we got some work done during that weekend, but nowhere near the amount. Yeah. Poor thing. She spent a lot of time, a lot of time on this. And then, you know, the production as well, trying to figure out. So I self-published it. I guess that probably goes without saying, but I should have made that clear. Um, and then, you know, trying to figure out how to produce it physically. And we worked with a printer in the South Bay and then a local bindery in Oakland who like handed the binding and the covers. And I mean, that took months and so much like oversight, you know, lots of disasters and just all kinds of trials and tribulations of that. Um, Adrian has another really good question here, kind of shifting away from the book. <clears throat> Um, have you had any assignments around coronavirus or the quarantine yet? Yes. Um, I, well, I was actually working on a really big commission right when this started that has now been just kind of put on hold because it didn't have a coronavirus aspect of it. Um, and so that's been kind of tough. Like, I don't know when they're ever going to run that. Um, but so I was kind of going in and out of the city some actually working in the homeless population before like right right around the time the shelter in place was happening. Mm -hmm. So that was a little unnerving, you know, because obviously that's a very vulnerable community and yeah. um, hopefully things are a lot better there now. But, you know, there, there's no social distancing in the tenderloin. Right. Um, so, so that was a sort of strange thing, like working normally in an abnormal situation. And then I've done a couple of assignments, yes, um, since then, you know, mostly outside. I don't think I've, you know, and at this point, I wouldn't go in, in someone's house, I don't think. Um, and I turned down an assignment, actually, that was like on the edge of what I felt comfortable with. And I was like, yeah, I don't don't feel like I can do that so yeah it's it's stressful mm -hmm. um yeah I really feel for the people who are out there shooting all the time because you know it's it was just such a process of it just a whole other layer of anxiety right and then you know cleaning your camera and yourself like coming back home right into your space after being out shooting it makes going to the grocery store a lot easier, you know? Yeah. But yeah, but I haven't done a ton. I've only done, you know, a couple, a couple things since this started. So. Yeah. It's really tough. You know, the, the new issue that we're working on doesn't have any assigned photography in it. Oh, um, really? Yeah. And that's not entirely why, but it's definitely been like, we had an option to photograph somebody and just opted not to and just go yeah. with something else just because, you know, it didn't seem worth it, you know, ultimately. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. it seems like there's legal, I mean, not just personal, you know, people maintaining their own personal health and the health of others, but also some intense legalities and question marks around the legalities of that right now that people are discussing, especially in the photographic community, and it's confusing. So I don't know, you know. I, I'm curious about that. I've just been keeping a half eye on the legal, the legal side of it. But I know the new one is that you're now allowed to photograph outside. But there was the whole question of, well, what does that exactly mean for professional work? So, yeah, I don't know. I mean, plus the other side, you know, I know a lot of photographers, there's a, a lot of photographers talking about you know, if you are sent out on assignment, are you going to get compensated for quarantining yourself if you're in a vul if you are in photographing a vulnerable population, which you know from the magazine perspective, it's like I can't pay somebody for two weeks 
right. you know, I, I can only pay, we can do, can't do that even if they're on assignment, you know, let alone, but then, you know, I was talking to Danny Wilcox Frazier this morning and he was just in Detroit and he's quarantining himself for two weeks just because of that. Like, yeah. you know, he can't shoot for two weeks, you know? Yeah. yeah. I've seen a lot of discussion about hazard pay around this and I didn't get, and I didn't ask for hazard pay because you know, last time I did an assignment was like three or four weeks ago. Um, but that's another thing, just like leaving your house to go make pictures, even if you're outside and even if it seems like it's not particularly high risk, like should it still be, you know, hazard pay worthy? And then what, what does that entail? Right. Mm -hmm. And then you have somebody like Victor Blue, who is literally a combat photographer yeah. and the New York Times hired him because he is a combat photographer to photograph inside the hospitals in Brooklyn and Queens, you know, so he's front line. It's, it's insane. Yeah. I've been, yeah. Wondering who's been photographing those, those images. Sorry to interrupt, but yeah, I've been thinking about the photographers behind those images in the hospitals. Yeah. And that's, you know, Vic, Vic Blue is one of those people, but like I said, he's somebody who spent a lot of time in war zones and just really intense situations in general. So I think they're thinking, in hiring him is we're going to hire somebody who we know will definitely take necessary precautions and isn't going to be naive or cavalier about it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, for sure. And then obviously having the, the right PPE. I mean, there, you know, I've seen Philip Montgomery, you know, was doing a lot of stuff in hospitals and, yep. you know, the full, you know, they've got to be completely in what level three hazmat, you know, um, which and is that's another really level of challenge to shooting. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. For sure, I cannot imagine. Yeah, it's pretty hardcore. Yeah. Mm. You know, and then the flip side of that is, you know, we were going to work with Devin Yalkin, who's speaking on Friday, to make some portraits for us. And he has this setup where he essentially has somebody in, a, in the house of the person that he's photograph he does it remotely so he has this whole way to do remote portraits um basically where he's kind of just he is acting as an assistant or a director more and having somebody else set up a, a phone you know to make the photo yeah it's really interesting. yeah, cool. yeah I've, I've heard a little bit about that yeah. yeah anyway any other questions for preston uh i have a question of a person and i really love your work overall for the also the between the devil work and i have a question that is there any other a long-term project you are currently working on or if not then do you have any idea or like plan you want to go with in the future yeah um well thank you i one of the problems I have is having too many projects going on at once and it's hard to <laughs> bring them to fruition. And I also find shooting is the fun part, but when it comes to like the putting the book together and like getting the work out there, that's the part that I tend to like back burner. It's just not as much fun. Um, so yeah, I'm, the remember me project is a big focus right now. Um, and that's definitely long-term that's in its 15th year. So I'm going to hopefully be doing some shooting in the next few months with that and um, hope want to put that out, you know, before too long, but we'll see, you know, it's just hard to know what's happening now uh, with 2020. And then I also have another series that's very different, but it's landscape based that I started, I was teaching in Montana last year, last uh, spring semester. And so I started a project. It's just a pure creative outlet um to kind of counter you know the teaching part and so i was out there shooting um while i was there for a few months last year and then i've been made one more trip back since and so that's another project that i wouldn't say is necessarily long term but a, a series that i've been working on that i'm also sort of in the editing stage with now and i've got some scanning and stuff to do I'm going to try to use my quarantine time um with with that project too so yeah those are the main ones cool Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Okay. Thank you, Preston. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Very awesome. Yeah. This was fun. Yep. Um, 
hopefully I'll get to see you in person again soon. Yeah. <laughs> At some point, whatever stage that is. That and I have a, a rough, um, there's a, a photo thing that's been batted around at work. So I'm going to talk to you about it after this and see. I don't cool. know if it comes see. through, but we'll see. Yeah, yeah. that'd be awesome. Okay. Cool. Well, thanks, everybody. Um, and feel free to follow up. Um, if anybody has any questions, you want to shoot me an email or something, my website's got my email and Instagram and then newsletter sign up if anybody's interested in all that. So future books and projects and stuff. So, all right. We'll have a good uh, rest of the semester. Thanks, Preston. Stay all right. Thanks, y'all. Take care. Thank, Take care. You. Thank you. All right. Bye, guys.